Coming up, Matt continues his look at the PCW show. I play some games. I chat to Jeff. And end with a type-in. Let's get on then. In 1988, the PCW show changed its name to simply The PC Show, and it moved to a new venue, but sadly, to a venue that no longer exists. Earl's Court was Britain's premier exhibition venue for most of the 20th century. Constructed near South Kensington, London, the Art Moderne design of American architect Charles Howard Crane was opened in 1937. The ambition was to create Europe's largest structure by volume, including a giant internal pool for watercraft exhibitions like the National Boat Show. Fast forward to 2023 and the site has been demolished due to declining attendance. There's nothing here apart from optimistic billboards, attractive artwork and a lonely security turret. Are you still there? The future is in limbo. But back to 1988. How was this venue different to Olympia? You may remember that Olympia was split into multiple sections across two halls. This allowed for a clear sense of social boundaries. Imagine you'd come to witness the world's fastest daisy wheel printer, or to try out the latest analytical database manager from Borland, only to accidentally end up face to face with thousands of spotty teenagers fighting over the last few carrier bags and stickers. It sounds like fantasy, but in Earl's Court it could really happen, because everything was on one huge, gigantic floor. But that seems to have been the plan. Still organised by Montbuild, the change of show name coincided with the rethink on location. Olympia could host a business hall and a leisure hall, but a larger venue could include a middle ground for those companies who fell somewhere between home computing and small businesses. The 1988 PC show had much to boast about. It was hoped that the relaunched venue would push attendance up from 75 to 100,000. It would feature 400 companies from across the globe. In keeping with this, there would also be dedicated support for international visitors. A music village would explore the growing relationship between music and micros. The show would also double as a conference, with a series of half-day professional seminars across the entire scope of the show. The final of the National Computer Games Championships would be held, sponsored by US Gold and organised by Newsfield. Pepsi Cola would provide a giant video wall that would show the final, and invite visitors to take the Pepsi Challenge in a taste-testing booth. You can keep your Pepsi though. Give me ZX Cola anytime. Promotion-wise, expectation was off the chart thanks to Newsfield, who inserted an unprecedented 20-page show guide into Crash, Zap64 and the Games Machine. It contained previews of around 40 of the expected exhibitors, plus artist concepts of stands, information on how to get to the show, PR sound bites, a map of the giant floor, and all peppered with some satirical visitor profiles from the mind of Mel Croucher and the pencil of Robin Evans. This guide was very exciting in the weeks leading up to the show, my own copy here being reread several times. And so, with the aid of our bag of freebies, let's begin our PC show and tell. It's the 17th of September 1988. A group of us are about to enter the show, and we're anxious about the new layout. This won't be a problem if we have a really good map in the show guide. I'm sure there will be one, there always is. First stop is PCW Magazine, who are celebrating their 10th birthday. They're still sponsoring the show, and they've been allowed to retain the W that has been removed from the show name, presumably due to the cost of reprinting. I get the show guide and my identity badge. Why do I have an identity badge? I have no idea, but I feel important, and it's great. We then move on to, wait a minute, where are the exhibitor names? Yes, one improvement this year is the removal of exhibitor names from the map, replaced with an unreliable key. This may make navigation trickier. We begin by visiting the business hall, to the left side of the building. This doesn't take long at all, because only over 18s are permitted, so we don't get in. Apparently, Microsoft are promoting some things called Word and Excel. Whatever they are, they're going to have to wait. And on that note, that concludes the business hall. 
Next, it's time to investigate the Central Hall, where worlds collide. On the Amstrad stand, the unquestionable highlight for Spectrum users is the new Sinclair PC200. No, actually, it isn't. Who asked for this? What we have here is a pretend Sinclair professional computer, which is really just an IBM PC compatible, and it's not fooling anyone with its nice black colour and Sinclair logo, apart from gaming veteran Peter Harris or housewife Christine Collins. It can keep its four colours, though I will take a snazzy brochure and a slightly dull Amstrad bag. Next we move on to TSM Limited, better known as Trojan Products. They're demonstrating their CADmaster graphics software and light pens. My brother already has one of these on his Spectrum. It's very slow, but it does work, though I prefer my AMX mouse. The versions on more powerful computers are impressive. I pick up a flyer. Talking of more powerful computers, I've heard a lot about Acorn's Archimedes range, and we recently got one in our school, though there is usually a bit of a queue to get on it. Today's focus is on the Archimedes 440. This computer is 32-bit, and the possibilities feel endless. It's apparently so powerful that users can write proper games in BASIC. I get a brochure to read later, though it does look very expensive. It's time to investigate the leisure hall and see if it measures up to the hype. I start with Ocean and Imagine, where the word of the day is licenses. Original games are also on the menu, so among the likes of Platoon and Rambo 3 we find Where Time Stood Still, Match Day 2 and Firefly, though as licenses go Robocop looks like being something special. It's a similar story with Imagine, with Target Renegade standing out from the wall to wall arcade licenses. I collect a copy of the Ocean 1988 catalogue. Next door, US Gold has plenty to be pleased about, and visitors can win a Kawasaki motorbike. There's also Dungeons and & Dragons and Sega's Thunderblade coin-op. However, there is much noise coming from somewhere nearby. This turns out to be the queue to get into the Microprose stand. As well as a colour advert in the guide, this year they have hired a Super X simulator, in keeping with their slogan, the action is simulated, the excitement is real. 14 people can ride at a time, but at this rate it will take all day to get on it, and we reluctantly move on. The simulator is sponsored by WH Smith. I think that in the future, every WH Smith store will feature a Super X simulator to demonstrate the latest games. Houston have upped their game this year and have changed their famous blue company logo to a lizard. I don't know why a lizard represents Houston, but the design is cool. I pick up a lizard bag and a Cybernoid 2 poster in A3 size. The lizard design is also available on a t-shirt. Interceptor had a big hit last year with Joe Blade on the player's label. They're launching Joe Blade 2 at the show and the buzz is that it's bigger than the first game and Joe has been working on his muscle building. I pick up a copy of the game and look forward to this one. Next stop is Incentive, who got a whopping 97% in crash last year for Driller, their first freescape game. This year they are promoting the third game, Total Eclipse, and there is also interest in their graphic adventure creator software. I managed to get Dark Side, the second Freescape game, at a discounted show price. Moving on to hardware, Dynamics Marketing Limited are showing off their durable Competition Pro joystick range. Some of the range now feature micro switches for greater accuracy, and one has rapid fire and slow motion. I pick up the Competition Pro flyer. Towards the back of the hall, Telecomsoft have gone for one giant stand with each of their brands displayed separately. Rainbird are focusing on 16-bit products like Starglider 2 and Fish. On the Firebird stand I get excellent show discounts on Virus, Earthlight and Samurai Warrior. Also I pick up issue 6 of Telecom Soft News, which details the latest products and which ones I can get on my Spectrum. On the Silverbird stand I watch a demo of Hopper Copper. I know it's dodgy, but who wouldn't want to bounce around town on a space hopper arresting criminals? I do my duty and hand over £1.99 and make sure to get a receipt. Domark have brought a bus, which they're using to promote their spitting image game. Rambo is driving the bus, and Margaret Thatcher is talking to guests. Domark have just signed a three-year deal with Atari Games to produce conversions under their new Tengen label. DeGale Marketing currently have the distribution rights to the Nintendo Entertainment System. Last year it was pushed by Mattel, but Nintendo was displeased by their mismarketing of the system as a toy. DeGale are trying to tempt me away from my versatile home computer, using several games including RC Pro-Am, made by Rare, and The Amazing Light Gun. I can't get my parents to see the benefit of having one of these in the house, so for now I'll have to make do with the official Nintendo leaflet. Palace seem to have missed the printing deadline for this year's show guide. Either that, or they're hoping the products will speak for themselves. But with the Spectrum version of Barbarian 2 shaping up nicely, they have nothing to worry about. It's important that I do what I can to help with promotion, so I pick up two copies of the Barbarian 2 flyer. Next door to Palace, we visit Anko. I don't know why I picked this up, None of these games are even available on the Spectrum. 
With the growing presence of 16-bit machines at the show, I guess I was interested in the Amiga's graphic potential. Let's move on. Finally we come to our trusty friend and Crash publisher, Newsfield. The merchandise has been relaunched to promote Crash, Zap64 and the games machine on an equal footing, and there's plenty of it. They are also launching new horror and movie magazines and displaying the winning entries in the computer art exhibition. I pick up a bag and a load of Game Grabber stickers. And that ends our virtual tour. Or so I thought. One of our group runs back in to spend his vital train money on a Houston t-shirt, and now he can't get back to the Midlands. He's going to have to stay at my grandparents' home in London and come back in the car with us later. Such is the power of the lizard. The PC Show 1988 was a major success and was heavily covered in the press. Crash Magazine devoted four pages to the show review, only scratching the surface of the contents. They noted, however, that the organisation of facilities and equipment needed improving, and that the weekend days were overly crammed. And congratulations to Stuart Campbell, who was the Spectrum Champion in the final of the National Computer Games Championships. What were your memories of this show? Did you attend? Were you an exhibitor? Let us know in the comments. Paperboy was released into the arcades in 1985, and was a shift away from shooting or platform games. Using a custom cab with handlebars, you controlled a young paper boy on a mission to, well, do his job really, deliver papers. This was made tricky by the isometric view, and having to remember which houses wanted papers, and the numerous obstacles like cars, bins, fences and fire hydrants. The Spectrum version was released by Elite Systems in 1986, and gave pretty much the same gameplay, but obviously had to make some allowances. There are no difficulty levels, the play window is much smaller, and of course colour and sound are very limited. Instead of having to remember which houses to deliver to, you just look out for the sun signs outside of the houses. You then have to throw a newspaper at them. I thought this was not in the arcade version, but it is. So what was really the point of showing you the houses before the game started then? Oh well. Along the way you can collect more newspapers. And you can also throw newspapers at other things to gain more points. You can play the game slowly or pedal like crazy, but this nearly always ends in an accident. Each crash is accompanied by a quote at the top of the screen before you continue your quest. There are cars, fences and other obstacles to avoid, but the game feels flat. Without that bouncy tune and colourful graphics it loses something. It's a fair conversion with nicely defined and smooth graphics, and I'm sure people would have enjoyed this seeing the arcade game and wanting to play it at home. I found it easier to control than the arcade, at least using MAME, and I got much further. The sound is a bit sparse, no in-game music, but some decent tunes in between. No speech either, and the sound effects are a bit limited. After the paper delivery section, you get to ride some rough ground that includes obstacles and jumps. You can also throw newspapers at targets for extra points. If you complete this, you move on to the next street. Overall, not a bad conversion, and rated highly by the magazines at the time. This is Gunstar, released by Firebird Software in 1987. Written by Pete Goff, who also wrote things like Scumball, Ghouls and Ghosts and Mad Nurse, this is a classic shoot-'em-up that arrived late onto the Spectrum scene. You start with one ship type. You leave the mothership and it's straight into action with swarms of aliens. As you lose lives, and you will, you move on to the other types of ship. There's no actual difference between them other than looks, so you don't get any extra weapons or speed. The names of the pilots change randomly and vary from crew members of aliens 
to the author's friends. The game is difficult, and it can become frustrating, or at least it was for me, and things get harder. Once you get past the aliens, it's the obligatory asteroids, and these can be a real headache, and I found this a bit annoying. The graphics are great though, well defined and they look good. There are nice effects when you die, and the explosions round off a graphically pleasing title. Sound is also used well, with various effects, all very well suited to the game. No shoot em up would be complete without a boss battle, and this game has several of them. Shoot out the turrets, and it's onto another staple of shooters, the docking sequence. I had to poke immunity to get this far, because the game really was tricky for me. I think this may have been one of those games that slid under the radar. I've never heard it mentioned in top 10 listings or favourite games, but it is well written and plays really nicely. Another aspect of this is that the more you shoot, the higher your temperature goes, as shown on the panel at the bottom right. So you have to be careful not to let it overheat. You also have to be careful with fuel, although I never ran out during the game. And to top it all off, it even has a silly high score table. If you like shooters, and are good at them, unlike myself, then give this a try. And today we're going to play Fred, because Jeff says it was a good idea. Well, this is a reverse of what we did last series, where I played a game and you asked me questions to try and put me off. We decided, well I decided, it would be a good idea if you played a game and I asked you questions to put you off. Right here, we'll give it a try. There's the gravestones, anybody uh, vigilant enough will notice that there's some initials on there, so when you die you put your initials in and they appear on those four gravestones uh, that only appear if you sit and wait a little while which I suppose we're going to have to do now. Have you got any questions? Oh, there you go. I guess I've got any questions before we start, but there you go. PJA. I died deliberately so I could get my name on them. I've started. <laughs> the first thing that strikes me about this game is that when you start, it looks like it's crashed. It, it does, actually. I, I was quite worried at that point. So when did you first play this game, Paul? When it first came out, I bought it as it came out. Uh, and do you still play it now? I do play Fred now. It's one of those games that I can get a glass of wine and just sit and relax and play because it's quite relaxing to play, just climbing up and down ropes, trying to find the exit to the pyramid, which is the aim. Uh, the maze is random each time, so... So a bit of trivia, you must know this. Do you know what this game was called on the Amstrad PCP? Oh, I CPC, do. CPC, uh, I do. Oh, God. Something on, uh, something on the ropes. Oh, God, what is it? Roland. Roland on the ropes. That's right. I guess they couldn't have called him Indiana Jones rip-off. Um, <laughs> well, they could have done, yeah. What do the... The top right, you have a question mark, a flag, and it L's the level of the tomb you're in. And you, you need to get that to zero, I'm guessing, to, to I get I think out. the flag is, is Pyramid 1, isn't it? Yeah. Is it? Yeah, so the, yeah, the flag's going to be the level you're on. And I think the question mark are bullets. In, in, in fact, when the next time I fire one, we'll see whether it goes down. I think the maze moves. It's it's character. It's quite jerky, isn't it? It's it's, it's character, character based it? movement. Yeah. yeah. So, so, have you ever completed this? Uh, I I've got to about level four, and there are various things that help you along the way. For example, you can find maps which will show you in the little blue box on the right a map of not all of the pyramid but the bits that you're in or the bits that you've been in so yeah. it makes it a lot easier you have an instinct if you play this game a lot do you get an instinct for where the dead ends are Paul? no because it's totally <laughs> random but you can you know when you're getting close because you you've you start you either get very lucky and get close to the top first and when you get close to the top you can actually see the trapdoor to escape yeah 
uh, or you've gone down everything else and there's only one possible route left. So I'm getting to that point now where there's only... Actually, that's a dead end there as well, isn't it? On the left. It's a dead end on the left. The only way now is through here, which is like drop city. Now that, that little artifact thing, at least it kind of tells you that you haven't been in that direction. Now I'm stuck here. <laughs> I mean, that's a nasty dead end with those three drops of acid. Are they acid? It... And, um, and are those little magenta things hedgehogs? I think that one's a dead end too. be funny if you climb up there and you get out. So on later levels, do right. I, I know you get more variety, but tell us about them, Paul. On later levels, you get things like chameleons that climb up and down the ropes, which means you have to swap sides, so you have to do that to avoid them. And yeah. also you get mummies that chase you around and if you're very lucky they will trip and fall down one of the chutes and you will be stood here for example and you'll see one just come plummeting down the left hand chute. <laughs> I don't know why, it's quite funny, when I saw that it was actually quite funny just to see them plummeting down there. This feels like a dead end to me though. Oh, come on. <laughs> what do you think Jeff? I think this. I think for a dead end? I think this is the way out. <laughs> I now think this is the way out. Definitely. I don't think this is the way out. I think that right hand one's the way out. But we'll give it a try. No, you can't get up that bit. It's a dead end. That's a dead end. Yeah, there. so you have to keep going right, don't you, to get to that bit? Yeah, but you can't. It's a dead end. It, it's an omen. We're, we're on our way. It hasn't taken long for those old skills to come back, has it, Paul? <laughs> Only about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> If this comes to a dead end, then I, I am... <laughs> right, okay. Oh, there's the map. Top right, there's the map. Um, it appears that, as with when I was playing games, you were talking to me and putting me off. I've managed to do the same to you. Right. So that was Fred, Paul. Um... <laughs> yes. This is Crazy Caverns, released by Firebird Software in 1984. You are in a crazy cavern, and there are ten mouths to feed. I've no idea why there are giant mouths in caverns, but hey, it's a Spectrum game. You control Cubie Crammer, who has to push all the crunchy cubes into the mouths. Or more accurately, the face, because it doesn't really matter where you push them. In his way are crazy crashers who move around crazily and crash into QB, killing him. The game is fun to play, although there are control issues. The movement is in character squares, so often you push a cube too far, meaning you have to start lining things up again, and this means getting closer to those crashers. The graphics, as you can see, are basic, mainly 8 pixel user definable graphics, and sound isn't too bad though. And despite all that, I quite like playing this game. If the control was less sticky, the game would be far better. As it is, it's certainly worth a play, and not bad value at just £2.50 when it was released. Certainly give it a try. This is Hopman, released by Inufutu in 2023. Here we have a very simple looking game that plays like a classic arcade title. The idea is to collect all of the flags in the time limit and to get to the exit at the far right. The graphics are clean and crisp and this reminds me somewhat of a more complex Jumping Jack variant. Jumping Jack was a great game, and this one has that same feeling. There are lifts to use to get access to higher platforms, 
And you have to keep in mind that you can't jump through platforms. Well, you can, but not high enough required to get on them. To do that, you have to jump in clear space. And that caught me out a few times. There's a great tune playing throughout, and the levels are well designed and not too frustrating. Once you get to know the best routes to take, the game really begins to shine. A great game to play then, and highly recommended. Colony Invaders appeared in Personal Computing News in December 1983, and it was written by R. Blatchford. It's a small listing, when joined together fits about a full A4 page. Despite this though, it had its problems. The number 4 being placed on screen when an alien blew up, duplicate code everywhere, and the code that wasn't restored when the game restarted, and many more. Eventually though, we can see it. The game draws a landscape and then a sun, using the circle command, which is very slow. You have to protect your crops from the invading aliens. And to do this, you control a laser sight. To destroy an alien, you have to get the laser sight over the top of it, and the computer will auto-fire. The aliens do not attack you, they just head for the sun and if they hit it, they release radiation that destroys your crops, turning them magenta. The game uses the cursor keys for control, and this is not easily changed in the basic listing, because the game also uses the cap shift to double the speed of movement. This speed increase is very useful if you miss your first chance at the left hand side of the screen. You can rush back to the right hand side and have another go. The aliens move one at a time, randomly moving up and down, and you just have to hope that they're going to run into the site. As with most type-ins, it uses user-definable graphics that move in character squares, and it's just got the standard beeper for the sound effects. It's a little different though, and this is probably the first time it's been seen since it was published in 1983. You can grab it from my website shortly. <laughs> 